my name is Dr. Andrew Lischuk, and the title of my lecture today is Introduction to Musculoskeletal Imaging. At the end of this lecture, I hope you have a better understanding of the various different imaging modalities available to you, how to choose the best exam for a patient, and begin to appreciate the language and terminology used in radiology. Let's get started with the x-ray. X-rays are inexpensive, readily available at most institutions, and are the first-line imaging examination for most musculoskeletal indications. This includes trauma, tumor, and arthritis imaging. A small amount of radiation is used to obtain the radiograph, and this carries with it a small risk. It is important when obtaining musculoskeletal radiographs that we image the body part in question in at least two orthogonal planes. Orthogonal planes are perpendicular to one another. An example is the AP and lateral radiograph. Let's look at this patient who presents to us with ankle pain. There is no obvious deformity or fracture identified on the AP radiograph. However, careful examination of the lateral radiograph demonstrates the presence of an oblique fracture through the distal fibula denoted by the red arrow and an oblique fracture through the posterior malleolus of the distal tibia denoted by the yellow arrow. This patient presented with shoulder pain and deformity. Internal and external radiographs were obtained, which are both in the frontal plane projection. The humeral head, seen in the pink circle, lies inferior to the glenoid, which is seen as the yellow circle. We cannot definitely determine whether the dislocation is anterior or posterior on those views alone. The scapular Y-view radiograph shows us the orientation of the humeral head to the glenoid. The Y is formed by the intersection of the scapular body, scapular spine, and coracoid process. The glenoid fossa lies at the intersection of these lines. The humeral head is, in this case, positioned anterior and inferior to the glenoid fossa. This patient sustained a traumatic injury to the knee. There is an intraarticular fracture of the lateral tibial plateau with depression of the articular surface. There also is valgus angulation of the knee, which is the angle formed by a line drawn through the long axis of the femur and the long axis of the tibia. On the cross table lateral view of the same patient, we can see a lipohemarthrosis is present. The lower density fat depicted by the red arrow appears darker than the higher density blood products depicted by the blue arrow and rises to the top much like oil does with vinegar. When liquid fat is present in the joint space, this is a good sign that there is an intra-articular fracture. Here we have a patient who presented with vague knee pain. AP and lateral radiographs of the knee demonstrate the presence of a heterogeneous appearing mixed lucent and sclerotic lesion within the medullary space of the distal femoral metaphysis. Additionally, there is a faint elevated and partially calcified portion of the periosteum denoted by the red arrow, which indicates that there is a soft tissue component growing out of the bone into the surrounding soft tissues so rapidly that the periosteum cannot lay down any new bone to contain the process. This is called a Codman's triangle and is a sign of an aggressive osteosarcoma in this case. Computed tomography, better known as CT scan, is a higher cost examination compared to the plain radiograph. CT scans are readily available at most institutions and are excellent at depicting osseous detail and offer improved soft tissue evaluation. The acquired imaging data set is volumetric which means that the images can be manipulated in any plane and using advanced software, 3D imaging can be performed. CT imaging does involve significantly more radiation than the plane radiograph, and this should be considered as part of the risk profile. Here we have the same patient with the intraarticular tibial plateau fracture you saw earlier. The corresponding coronal CT image clearly demonstrates the depression of the lateral tibial plateau articular surface and allows better visualization of a break along the medial tibial metaphyseal cortex. The axial image of the same patient shows us the CT equivalent of the patient's lipohemarthrosis to greater detail. The fat, serum, and cellular components are easily seen 
and are referred to as the parfait side. CT scan imaging can be helpful in evaluating soft tissue infection. The sensitivity and specificity is improved when intravenous contrast is used. This patient presented with a sartorius abscess, which on imaging has an enhancing brighter rim with central fluid attenuation and a small locule of air. This patient had a more serious infection known as necrotizing fasciitis in which there is extensive subcutaneous gas throughout the posterior thigh. Note that the black attenuation of the gas is the same as the air external to the patient. This patient sustained a left acetabular fracture. A 3D volume rendered image was obtained and can be manipulated to help the radiologist and the surgeon better visualize the fracture for surgical planning. This data set can also be sent to a 3D printer to print a model of the anatomy. Magnetic resonance imaging is another common tool that we use. MRI is expensive and is not always available at all institutions at all times. The time to perform exams can range from 15 minutes to over an hour. MRI is the best examination to evaluate soft tissue structures and is highly sensitive to evaluate for occult fracture. Additionally, there is no radiation with MRI. This elderly patient presented to the emergency department with right hip pain. The initial plane radiograph demonstrated no evidence for displaced fracture. An MRI was obtained, which showed bone marrow edema in the region of the right greater trochanter with surrounding muscular edema. There was a corresponding low T1 signal line within the greater trochanter on the right, which represents the occult fracture line. This is the case of a 15-year-old whose knee gave out while running and cutting. On this sagittal midline MRI image through the knee, we can see that the anterior cruciate ligament is disrupted and is displaced inferiorly onto the tibia. The yellow line depicts the normal position of the anterior cruciate ligament. The bright signal above the patella represents the knee joint effusion. MRI is very useful in evaluation of osteomyelitis. Normal adult bone marrow is primarily composed of yellow marrow. This patient had an ulceration along the lateral aspect of the foot, and the normal fat signal within the fifth metatarsal has been replaced with a darker signal of the infected fluid. Ultrasound is another less expensive modality that we use for certain indications. MSK ultrasound is not yet universally available and quality imaging depends on an experienced technologist and radiologist. Ultrasound is excellent for looking at superficial soft tissue anatomy and determining whether something is cystic or solid. Ultrasound also allows for real-time or dynamic imaging. Because ultrasound uses sound waves, there is no radiation and it is considered safe. We most commonly use ultrasound for image-guided procedures in the superficial soft tissues. This patient had a fluctuant mass along the posterior aspect of the knee, which was a Baker's cyst. The darker areas in this image represent the hypoechoic fluid within a benign Baker's cyst. The thin red arrow shows a hyperechoic needle, which we placed into the cyst using imaging guidance. You'll notice that on this image of the same patient, the hypoechoic or darker area is significantly smaller because we were successfully able to aspirate several milliliters of fluid from the cyst, providing relief to the patient. This was an interesting case of a gentleman who struck the back of his hand against a concrete floor. Dynamic ultrasound imaging was performed while we flexed and extended the patient's finger. The hyperechoic tendon at the top middle of the image flips in and out of its normal position above the metacarpal. Normally, the tendon should remain positioned above the metacarpal. The final modality I will review today is nuclear medicine. In a nuclear medicine examination, a radiopharmaceutical is tagged with a specific cell or cell line, such as an osteoblast or white blood cell, and subsequent imaging is performed to see where the radiotracer accumulates. 
Two of the most common studies that a musculoskeletal radiologist uses are bone scans and white blood cell scans. These studies are time consuming and do involve radiation, but are less costly than MRI imaging. You may remember the case of osteosarcoma from earlier. On the corresponding bone scan to the left of the radiograph, there is a focus of increased osteoblastic activity seen as the dark line along the left knee. This bone scan image is from the patient with metastatic breast cancer who shows multiple areas of increased radiotracer uptake, which correspond to all of these areas of increased sclerosis on the representative CT image. Osteoblastic activity is ramped up due to the metastatic disease and appears as sclerotic regions on CT. In summary, I hope you have a better understanding of the imaging modalities we use, when to use them, and the limitations. Thank you.